capacity audience of a thousand participants from across India and several other countries. This is the first in a series of webinars by Surana and Surana in partnership with Loctopus, India's top law schools, namely the Symbiosis Law School and the Jindal Law School. The topics for this webinar have been shortlisted and chosen to give our audience and the policymakers actionable insights and takeaways for implementation after the current Corona lockdown is lifted. The current Corona lockdown, which is unprecedented in human history, gives us an opportunity to contemplate on important things which we do in life and to contemplate on life itself. Today's topic concerns the lasting impact of the Corona disruption on the ways and workings of the world. Work from home, online teaching, e courts distancing, and other similar things are now the new norm. Law, they say, is the codification of social norms. They also say that law is an instrument of social change. Law schools and legal education are bound to play a significant role in this transformation. We have a very distinguished panel to share with us their views on how legal education and law schools will help codify the new norms and drive social change. Now, before I call upon our first speaker, I request Tanuj Kalia, the founder of Loctopus, the virtual voice of the Indian law student and the enabler of informed and inspired career choices to quickly tell us how the participants can get their certificates. Over to Tanuj. Thank you, sir. Welcome everyone to this webinar. We have got a distinguished panel with us here today. I'll quickly tell you about the certificates. Uh, those who are desirous of a certificate have to fill in a short form we will be sharing the link to this form over chat and on the post on Loctopus. Uh, based on your answers, if your answers are sincere, you will be sent a link for the certificate. Our partner uh, law schools, Symbiosis Law School Pune and Jindal Global Law School, their students and faculty, they are exempt uh, from this uh, payment which has to be made at the end. Thank you, sir. So you're, you're on mute. Just to have a brief about how we are going to go about it, each of our speakers are requested to share their views in about 10 to 12 minutes. I will keep time and I will inform the speakers through the chat box at the end of the 10th minute. All attendees are requested to post their questions on the Q&A box. At the end of the presentation by all our speakers, Tanuj will lead the question and answer session. I will also join him. And we will post to our esteemed speakers the questions. Now, I have great pleasure in welcoming our first speaker, Dr. Sashikala Gurpur, the dynamic dean of the iconic Symbiosis Law School which today completes 50 glorious years. Dr. Gurpur has been recognized by LexisNexis among India's 100 legal luminaries for her contribution to legal education and for her contribution to jurisprudence by writing dozens of books and law articles. Dr. Gurpur 
has a master's and a PhD from the Mysore University. She is a Fulbright scholar and a visiting fellow at the Edinburgh Law School. Over to Dr. Shashikala Gurpur, Madam. Ma'am, could you please uh, unmute yourself? Sorry, I forgot. Yes, so thank you, Dr. Vinod. Uh, thank you, esteemed fellow panelists and uh, Mr. Tanuj and uh, our dear uh, audience across the country and maybe outside the country as well. A very good uh, evening to each and every one of you. Um, as the prime mover, uh, I would like to set a little background in the beginning for a minute that uh, how does legal education appear today in India? Uh, we already have the reference from the Bar Council's uh, Curriculum Development Committee report of 2010, which identifies four tiers of law schools in India. Now, when the COVID-19 crisis hit us, there were four tiers of responses as well. Uh, some of the law schools like us who are uh, heavily funded, who are resource rich, who have center stage the information technology as the lifeline of the law school did not get perturbed by the crisis. Secondly, we had the autonomy and the openness and the flexibility and student engagement in our decision making always in terms of co-creation of rules. Uh, we could respond immediately by uh, designing a formula of uh, extrapolating their internal marks uh, uh, grades into uh, term end grades and uh, deciding the grades. Secondly, also uh, delivering undelivered part of the curriculum, which was almost for three weeks, to be delivered online. So our uh, focus at that time uh, was more uh, student-centric, student welfareist. Uh, approach because 80% uh, of the students come from all over India. We did not want to take the risk for the belt at all in terms of government's uh, notification or announcement because what if the flights are closed? So we had a uh, we had to manage so many crises when this was hitting. We had a famous, uh, I mean, almost like a brand, you know, the International Criminal Trial Advocacy Moot. Some of the participants had come. We had to respectfully uh, send them away, safely send them away. We had to see that our students were immediately vacating the hostels. So they left things then and there and just left. And we told them, we will get back to you, but be with your family, be safe. So this is the dynamic of the governance of the law school. The other side that we saw was that we were in an advantageous position as a deemed university's constituent law school where there is a full autonomy and flexibility in terms of assessment. Although we had to conform to the Bar Council regulations in terms of its uh, framework. Uh, but I was talking to a friend of mine who was a vice chancellor in a Southern uh, state university. Most of the state universities had a constraint because they had to wait for the notifications. They have to adhere to the uh, norms of uh, uh, the uh, collegiate education, uh, etc. And uh, even the law universities, not I'm not sp speaking of the national law schools, which are relatively more uh, autonomous and open to new ideas with the young, bright uh, leadership in some law schools. But uh, the affiliated law schools or law schools which are affiliated to law universities, again, took the traditional conservative approach. So in these law schools, as it is, information technology is not the lifeline. So you could see that just like the different years of legal education, we had different years of responses to the crisis, the, to the challenges which, is, which were created by the lockdown. So at the same time, the second dimension is our preparedness for such a crisis. We know that our uh, five-year law course students who form the majority in any law school are very, very tech savvy. They are a typical millennial generation who are more interested in self-learning, who are open to contributing to the learning process. Uh, but we never took them seriously, I felt, because we always looked at uh, uh, didactic teaching coupled with uh, some of the innovative interactive pedagogies. But as they say, every disruption kickstarts innovation. So what we found was that our, uh, uh, you know, as a dean, I had to give the key result areas, which included uh, you know, online module creation, online teaching. We said, as per the UGC rule, 20% content should be online. So let us blend it in. So we had the European legal studies and other kinds of modules, which we brought in, even in the normal circumstances. But with the COVID crisis hitting, we had to completely switch over to online teaching. This must have been the challenge that all the law schools who wanted, like us, uh, to address the student uh, concerns. 
so and who had the relatively better academic and uh, governance freedom or autonomy the second challenge we faced was uh, or any law school will face at this time is uh, the way in which we will bring the experiential learning because ours is a public service uh, oriented profession it's a calling and uh, in a profession which is increasingly being challenged by the very technology which which today has become our savior is also challenging us in terms of artificial technology replacing some student is saying it's not audible is it uh, uh, i'm seeing in the dialog box so i request the tech team to look into it so uh, uh, in that limitation uh, how did we go about uh, uh, looking at experiential learning uh, i will tell you uh, skills training was already done uh, so we extrapolated those grades but then we said that experiential dimension of witnessing it with the sense experience what we call as the effective dimension of pedagogy we said that once the new semester begins we will accommodate that it is not a graded thing but it is the incremental learning so like this we created a kind of set of guidelines within four days of the lockdown announcement to see two objectives to be met one is not to defeat the course and program learning objectives and the outcomes second is compensating them irrespective of examination or grade where it could be tested so uh, i was reading about uh, the uh, issue of uh, how covid crisis is going to change the very approach of the legal industry and legal profession so in that context how the future is going to be impacted by the current crisis and uh, how will we respond as law schools for those future challenges so from that point of view i saw that we have challenges of maintaining our admissions we have challenges of maintaining our entrance examinations lsat has been postponed clat has been postponed symbiosis entrance test has been postponed when do we plan these tests how do we plan these tests what are the factors what are the data we take into consideration while planning these kinds of challenges then uh, Uh, the challenges are going to come or new things are going to look at us uh, in the face uh, in terms of the competency which will be required in the new era uh, in the faculty uh, in the lawyers uh, in the internship uh, occasion or job creation and increasing multidisciplinarity and collaboration is going to be required more and more uh, result orientedness and customer orientedness is going to be required so the very technology which be became our life saver is going to be our life saver so how do we switch our law schools uh, which are in three four tiers in terms of technical competence and technological access affordability and structured technological competence creation in students or skills creation other skills creation in students how do we do that how do we prepare our faculty to deliver the modules online because online delivery is different from the offline delivery in the offline delivery we have four different types of learning with the peers with the faculty with the activities with the co curricular extra curricular avenues do we modify our moot exercises also into online mode if we do that how do we uh, evaluate how do we change our evaluation rubrics so these questions are going to come then how do we plan our academic delivery is going to be hugely impacted Uh, currently ugc has put the 20% limit for uh, blending the online module uh, of course bar council does not put any restriction on that and today uh, and yesterday i have read the statements from the bar council saying that law schools must uh, start uh, online delivery because we are seeing that this covid crisis may not let us open colleges till september so do we keep our young students uh, not engaged till then or do we uh, start our online teaching in the date which we have formally announced and do we readjust our admission process in such a way that new students are engaged in pre induction modules do we uh, look at uh, online internships we created a nice rubric for online internship as well the types of activities the type of evaluation what are the deliverables which are expected we have an internship called service internship which is a mandatory service learning avenue now those students will be doing online based uh, organizational website analysis or a case study analysis but they will be exposed in the field once they come back it may be september it may be october that experience we cannot substitute because empathy creation and effective learning are going to be the most important things for the future when ai is going to challenge the human dimension of our profession so that's about the planning second is about the content 
currently curriculum content seems to be having little focus on skills except in certain law schools like us who are very very industry related uh, th there are many other law schools as well so how do we plan the content how our curriculum delivery is going to be affected how the technology in the center is going to be moderated with the digital divide issue which is there in this country as i told you my south indian vice chancellor friend said that i will not allow uh, online examination because my students don't even have electricity in their homes they can't access any online technology so i said don't they use cell phone she said that they use cell phone but they can't afford internet so this this kind of uh, varied situation is there here we fortunately are the leaders of the law schools where technology is the lifeline so how do we accommodate them in uh, our approach in, in case of future then how do we make our students uh, 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 better at data science and data driven decision making and friendly with the online learning and this online learning forcing our faculty and our workforce to switch to work from home more uh, it is going to be good for them in some way to balance their work work and life to create less carbon footprints if we could readjust the work hours but the negative side is that it could be uh, depriving them of the social interaction as well so how do we modify our uh, policy of ugc and bar council of india uh, and uh, how do we create good modules like in our uh, uh, university we have been doing a lot of research on what modalities we used which technology do we use how do we modify our current content into online content already we are prepared with 50% of the courses uh, adjusted to the online mode of delivery the next question is in undergraduate the learning outcome is of one type in postgraduate it is different type so how do we make postgraduate to be more research oriented and undergraduate to be more uh, uh, research oriented along with more of understanding oriented and concept oriented and interaction oriented i think the future impact is also going to be on the mode of delivery of law degree which currently we don't allow distance learning we don't allow online delivery in india so how it is going to be uh, unfolding i know that one of the panelists is going to talk about it whether the fee is going to be reduced if we look at the western university model they do not make much of a difference between online and offline uh, fee structure uh, how the content is going to be reoriented the last point uh, i want to talk about in terms of impact on the way in which the law school uh, curriculum is going to be is about the research dimension the research dimension already i'm seeing lot of my colleagues are into this course which we are offering in the health sciences the public health law uh, usually i used to teach it with two three people but this time uh, 10 of my faculty wanted to participate there the reason is very clear that covid has hit all of us and we want to observe how the law has impacted how or how the law is going to impact and how the law will be impacted we had to reorient a lot of things which you all also must have experienced one is uh, bringing in guest lectures and making guest lecturers to be online friendly so we had to run a little uh, training for them in advance and then make them uh, available reorienting uh, our current uh, uh, approaches study abroad programs compulsory uh, kind of uh, internationalization dimensions how do we handle uh, we already had introduced something called coil a collaborative online uh, uh, international learning so because we had all those preparedness already all those uh, competencies already it became easy for us to switch over in the crisis and our students were also very comfortable of course this generation is comfortable so the challenge is going to be uh, i identify four types of challenges one is how do we wade through these different years of law school in india law schools in india which is bar councils challenge which is going to be the challenge in the larger interest of larger milieu of india who are going to join these law schools uh and then uh, uh, the next challenge is going to be uh, how do we reorganize uh, training for the faculty and update them and uh, how do we customize our modules can we create an all india level of minimum uh, requirements uh, how do we uh, help people to work from home how do we facilitate effective learning 
especially the experiential learning that Dr. Menon towards the end of his mission was speaking about, um, uh, whether uh, law jobs are going to be limited uh, uh, because of this crisis. Uh, for the available law jobs, how do we prepare? How do we organize these jobs to be reaching to the students? And what are the cost cutting dimensions which can affect the affordability of legal education? Um, so my concluding statement is that uh, uh, we are, I mean, as a law school, we were able to handle it because we had uh, medical doctors at the leadership of the university. So we did everything based on scientific data, uh, information gathering and statistical analysis. We took our decisions step by step and kept uh, students informed. And uh, we also had a mechanism of uh, meeting students. I met all 2000 students on different occasions to know their concerns and uh, created a grievance redressal mechanism. So the transition needed all those kinds of different kinds of skills on the part of the law school leadership and faculty team. Uh, so law as the only profession which is recognized in the constitution and law students as the future defenders of rights and constitution need to be put in the center, in my opinion, when we are looking at the long-term impact of this crisis. Thank you, Pan. Thank you, Madam. You covered a lot of points. We will come back to you with a lot of questions at the end of this uh, yeah. session. Now, I have great pleasure in introducing our next speaker, Professor Dr. Arya Majumdar. He is the Dean of Admissions and Outreach at the rapidly rising Jindal Global Law School, which within 10 years of its establishment has gained global recognition for its academic rigor and contribution to jurisprudence. Professor Majumdar is an alumnus of NUJS West Bengal. He did his master's from the Tulane Law School. He has been a visitor at the University of Melbourne and an honorary research associate at the University of Liverpool. Professor Dr. Majumdar. Thank you very much, Dr. Sarana, and thank you to, to Tanuj and Loctopus for organizing this. It's a great pleasure to be here amongst some very distinguished panelists. The way I'd like to structure my approach to the COVID-19 crisis and the future of legal education in India is twofold. The first is what Dr. Gurpur has extensively covered is the study from home problem. The second problem or the second point that I'd like to raise in terms of my approach to this issue is that of a possibility of a resultant recession. So it is under the backdrop of the study from home and teach from home concept and a possibility of a recession due to the lockdown. It is under this backdrop that I'd like to approach this topic. I have four suggestions or recommendations or talking points, if you will, which should inform us in, in terms of what the future of legal education could be. The first that Dr. Gurpur has extensively covered in that Symbiosis Law School went complete online mode and did so very successfully. Um, and she mentioned that she was able to do so that because they're a well-funded law school and, um, and technology is available to them. Thankfully, we fall under the same brackets as well. When we realized that our students would have to be sent home, we decided to go online in under 48 hours. Now, different people have different choices of platform. So in conjunction with our IT head, we decided upon MS Teams, as opposed to Zoom or GoToWebinar or Google Hangouts or Google Classroom, uh, in spite of advice from one of our former students who is now working at Google as a policy advisor. So classes went online for us fairly quickly. But we soon realized that there are many issues with having classes online. To begin with, there, is, there are issues of student discipline. Now that is something that we really can't um, handle staying 2,000 miles away. While, while a student might be, might be present in a classroom, you never know whether the student is actually listening into the class or whether they're actually playing a video game. But that's on the side of the student self-discipline. We realized that there were issues in terms of teaching as well. 
Now, as faculty members, as law teachers, we've been used to be teaching in a classroom. And for those of us, I, I consider myself to be very, very fortunate to have been taught in the Socratic method by none other than Professor Dr. Madhav Menon himself. And we try to imbibe that Socratic method into teaching our own students at JGLS. But when you have the Socratic method, not in a classroom, but on an online mode, that creates problems. So there have to be adjustments made in the teaching pedagogy in moving from a classroom mode of learning to online learning. Most universities have moved online almost overnight. But at the same time, teachers have had very little training in online teaching, if at all. I, for one, certainly haven't had any online, any, any training in online teaching. And we've had to make adjustments very, very quickly. Moving forward, <clears throat> as faculty members, we will need to understand and appreciate that there will be changes to the way law is taught, particularly in the Socratic method. Uh, for those of you um, who are unaware, the Socratic method is merely the teacher asking enough questions to the student and let the student come to an answer themselves. It's a way of training the mind to think like a lawyer. Now this requires a lot of give and take, a lot of back and forth between the teacher and the student until one comes to the conclusion that is why the law exists the way it does. So that's my first issue in terms of the future of legal education amidst the, the COVID crisis. The second point I'd like to raise is that we're all concerned and we're all focused on the five-year BA LLB or a BBA LLB or the BCom LLB integrated program, which for, for disclaimer purposes and full disclosure, I too was a part of at NUJS. But there is a need to revisit the future of the three-year LLB program, especially now when we are facing a potential recession. Our past experiences with recessions have shown us that former employees who find themselves out of a job in a recession perhaps might go back to graduate school to reskill themselves. I was working in London when the 2008 2009 recession hit, and a number of people who I was working with, or a number of people I knew, went back to graduate school to complete their masters. But here's my suggestion. Instead of a master's degree, perhaps we could consider strengthening the three-year LLB program to attract people who've already been trained in, let's say, the study of sciences, humanities, um, social sciences, engineering, and I dare say even medicine to study law and consider becoming lawyers. For example, I have taught a number of students in the three-year LLB program at JGLS who were scientists who were doctors who were engineers and they're all in professions that merge their former degree as well as the law degree the future challenges of law as as dr gurpur has correctly pointed out will emerge out of issues in technology artificial intelligence human cloning stem cell research data privacy and many such com complex issues and all of these require a broader understanding of other disciplines as well we do require a multidisciplinary understanding of law. And therefore, I believe that there is a need for developing strong and reputed three-year LLB programs across law schools in India that will enable graduates of other disciplines to consider the study of law if they find themselves out of a job or even maybe after their undergraduate degree program. The third suggestion I'd like to make is to echo Dr. Gurpur's suggestion is to promote research and knowledge creation. I agree completely that law schools ought to be research institutions. As faculty members in the law school, we ought to be consistently pushing the boundaries of human knowledge. And therefore, there is a need for promoting research in law schools, either through the work of faculty or perhaps through the work of students engaging in publishing on issues of legal significance. At present, even the best of our law schools are at best teaching institutions. We need to have radical reforms to deal with this crisis. 
while financial incentives could be one way by which we can slightly change the situation, the bulk of reforms is about developing world-class law schools that can inspire law graduates to consider legal academia as a coveted career option. Currently, legal academia is not on the top three list of, of students who are graduating from law schools. I can bet my bottom dollar that most law graduates will want to be a Harvey Specter. Law graduates should develop a sense of aspiration and, and keenness to contribute to legal academia. That will give them the opportunity to teach and research. And like I mentioned earlier, push the boundaries of human knowledge. As I said, that present corporate careers and, and the legal profession are far more attractive for law graduates as career options. And that, in my view, needs to change. The fourth and final suggestion I have in terms of the future of legal education in India is to build stronger partnerships, not just with partner universities across the world, not just about <coughs> student mobility or short-term study abroad programs or, or semester exchange. At JGLS, we have enough and more of those. But what I'm trying to suggest is there's a need for all the actors and stakeholders of the legal professions particularly lawyers and judges who might be listening in perhaps to become active participants in the legal education arena. At present, corporate law firms and, and the broader corporate legal sector have a very limited vision in terms of legal academia and view law schools purely as recruiting grounds with all due respect to lawyers and judges. Unfortunately, they have a very limited engagement with law schools seeing them mostly as fertile venues for recruiting lawyers and law clerks, or at best giving the occasional lecture to educate and inspire students. There is no doubt that a partner of a top law school, uh, the partner of a top law firm or a senior advocate or a sitting judge, they do give the occasional lecture and they do educate and inspire hundreds and thousands of students on a yearly basis. All of these aspects are of engagement are important and do have a positive impact. I believe that lawyers and judges should build a stronger and substantive collaboration with law schools. When I go back to my friends that I've made in law firms across the world, they often tell me, well, you guys might give them the law degree, but the actual law is learned in courts and in the boardroom. I'd like to see that change. And we cannot build a legal profession that is expected to adhere such high standards without a partnership with people who matter the most, which is people in the legal profession. With that, I'd like to close. Um, thank you very much again for this opportunity. These were my four points in terms of um, the future of legal education in India amidst the, the COVID-19 crisis and where I think it needs to go. Back to you, Dr. Sarana. Thank you, Professor. I must appreciate you for completing within your time. And you made some very important points. You did end your talk by saying that there need to be more partnerships with people who matter. I would like to mention here that this is the 25th year where Surana and Surana has been engaging with law schools across the country. And we have touched more than 60,000 law students to develop oral and written advocacy skills. Now, I have great pleasure in introducing our next speaker, Professor Nigam Nagahalli. He is the Dean of Law at the BML Munjal University, one of India's fastest raising institutions. Dean Nagahalli is an alumnus of the National Law School of India, Bangalore, where he did his LLB. He then got his master's in international taxation from the New York University Law School. And he did his DPhil from Oxford University School of Law. He is a very distinguished academician. He has taught law in London, practiced law in New York, written many books and articles before taking up his current role as the Dean of the Law School at BML Munjal University. Now over to you, Dean Nagahalli.
Sir, you are on mute. Thank you very much, Mr. Sorana, and thank you, uh, Tanuj, for um, inviting me for this uh, uh, for this very important talk. Um, I think um, the three kind of broad issues that have been discussed so far um, are, uh, are very important uh, at this time because everybody is trying to find an answer. Um, I think we don't have uh, the answers yet. I think they'll, they'll take us a bit of time to figure out what the right answers are. Uh, but I think the, uh, the the reason to explore it is is uh, uh, is I think quite well understood by people. So let me um, uh, uh, let me start by uh, telling you what I'll do over the next ten minutes. I'll I'll talk about uh, broadly three issues, and actually uh, some of the issues that I'm going to be talking about uh, will have some uh, cross connections with. Uh, um, uh, Professor Majumdar and, and uh, Professor Shashikala as well. So I'm glad that they went before me. Uh, I think there will be some important, uh, important parallels between what I'm talking and what they are, uh, what they uh, told you as well. Um, so the first thing that I'll talk about is uh, generally about um, the future of legal education uh, post COVID. It's an interesting thing. Um, of course, the future is, uh, is that the students are not uh, on campus. Uh, they are at home or, uh, or elsewhere, but they're not uh, in the classrooms, they're not in the hostels. And as uh, uh, Dr. Shashikala uh, said, it might well be September by the time uh, they might come back. Um, and uh, September itself might be pushed uh, to some other month uh, if things get worse. Uh, so uh, the first issue of course is how does legal education look if uh, we don't have people in classrooms, we don't have people in hostels, right? And there's one big part of it, which is the efficacy of online education, which is a separate topic and I'll talk about that in a bit. But keeping online education aside, I think we must first ruminate a little bit on life of a student who is uh, not connected with his teachers and is not connected with his friends, right? And a big part of legal education, certainly for everyone who's on the panel here, uh, who've been to law schools, uh, is that you learn a lot from your peers and you learn a lot through your uh, connection with your teachers. And that's going to be missing. Right? So how to bridge that gap? And I'm not even talking about online education yet or its efficacy. I'm just talking about the idea that for a considerable period of time, students will miss the company of their peers and the company of their teachers. And that is a major issue, I think, um, post-COVID, um, this is an issue despite the fact that uh, the present generation is sort of used to a lot of uh, social media, and therefore the kind of intera personal interaction that probably the older generation, and I'm including myself in that, are used to might not be a major worry for the younger generation. Even then, despite that, I think um, the younger generation at some point of time is gonna miss this kind of personal connect that, uh, is required uh, um, in order not just to have a, uh, a good life, but to learn well, right? So you learn a lot from your seniors, you learn a lot from your teachers when you talk to them outside the class. And that kind of personal connect, I think, is a problem. And how we will bridge that uh, is an issue that all of us, all law schools have to consider, right? Whether the law schools are technologically advanced or not, this issue is gonna be a problem for everyone. Uh, the other problem is, again, a big part of law school, all of the people on this panel can, can uh, confirm this, is staying on your own, right? Um, having, uh, staying away from your family, staying on your own, developing life skills that you won't otherwise have developed. Um, that is going to be missing as well for law students. Uh, so, and that's, again, a big part of, uh, um, of the law school experience. Uh, that is going to be a, a problem, regardless of whether online education is successful. The idea of somebody going out of the comfort zone and staying on their own and learning from that experience uh, will be missing the longer the student stays away uh, from, from the law school classes. Uh, the other final problem, I think, in this category is that uh, uh, what happens to internships? As I said, there are cross connections here. Uh, Dr. Shashikala mentioned that uh, already. The, we have online internships, but online internships have to be carefully calibrated. 
Um, uh, Dr. Shashikala mentioned how she's done that, how she's going through a certain process. And this kind of careful thinking through online internships uh, has to happen at every law school, right? So at Munja Law School as well, we're thinking about how to address this, how to ensure uh, that the students gain uh, valuable experience, how do you ensure we monitor the progress. And an online internship, therefore, brings with it a set of challenges that we hadn't uh, thought of in the case of uh, uh, on-site internships. In addition to the pro looming problem we have, which is the kind of the problem I already told you, which is that you learn a lot more from on-site internships than online internships, right? So you learn to deal with people, you learn to be in a different area, you learn to interact with people you don't know. And uh, some of all that is going to be missing in online internships. So this is kind of my broad issue with post-COVID um, uh, legal education challenges. The issues I mentioned are not actually connected directly with legal education, but I think they're connected with kind of the overall law school experience. And that overall law school experience is gonna be affected. And we have to somehow collectively as leaders of law schools, think about how we're gonna manage that. Now that brings me to my second and more focused part of the, uh, of the question, which is um, what do we do with online education, right? So the, everybody's saying, look, legal education is moving online. Now keeping aside the regulatory aspects of this problem, right? again, something that's already been discussed here. The other issue is how do we make legal education uh, more effective and more engaging, right? So I have written about this elsewhere and uh, the way I put it is, look, new uh, technologies uh, will still have to grapple with old problems. And the old problems are that students sitting outside the classroom at their homes may not be interested in what you're teaching and may not get the most of what you're teaching if you're teaching it online. Much like uh, what Professor uh, Majunda said, uh, when, uh, when the COVID crisis hit uh, the Munja Law School, uh, we were up and uh, thinking about various online uh, classroom technologies immediately, and then we implemented it. Um, we went actually one step ahead, and we had uh, online classes and then online examinations. So we are, uh, we are going to shortly hold online examinations as well. Uh, and, and then that comes with its own set of issues. Uh, we are figuring out how to proctor uh, the exams. We are trying to... Um, by technology that will help us uh, do a, an online proctoring where we can actually monitor what the computer screen of the student is doing um, across uh, across cities. Uh, so it's, uh, and, those, and there are technologies out there that, that help us do that, but I'm sure there'll be teething issues in the application of all these technologies, right? So the, the but the, coming back to the main issue, which is how do we ensure that, uh, online classes are uh, uh, engaging and are uh, effective. Uh, there are various strategies to do that. You know, we make the classes more interactive. Finally, we ensure that uh, what Dr. Shashikala was talking about as the didactic way of teaching is jettisoned in favor of a more, uh, as what Professor Majumdar put as the Socratic method of teaching uh, is employed with the attendant issues that uh, that Professor Majumda was saying, which is that the Socratic method is sometimes quite chaotic in the online classroom. And therefore I have said that the mute button is a teacher's best friend in an online classroom. Uh, and, and that's partly because of the fact that people, when they tend to talk over each other in the traditional classroom, it's easier to maintain that as opposed to online classrooms. Um, but it, I think, I believe it can be managed. I think we can have a more interactive session and therefore have a more um, uh, exciting and engaging conversation uh, in the online classroom as well. In fact, I would go so far as to say that we can flip this question on its head. If somebody asks me, how do we uh, bridge this uh, personal connect between the student and the teacher? I tell him, actually online teaching might help you do it better, right? So it might well be the case that online teaching enables this kind of one-to-one -one interaction between the student and the teacher that's actually harder to do in a traditional classroom, especially with students uh, who are shy uh, or who are not able to speak up or their voices are drowned by other dominant students. So those kind of issues are actually somewhat mitigated uh, in the online space. 
as we found out when we did our online teaching. And therefore, it is actually better in some ways that we have this kind of personalized teaching uh, online, provided it is done well. Everything has its, uh, uh, has its uh, challenges. If it's not done well, but provided it is done well, provided you have the software that allows you to have breakout sessions, um, provided you have uh, separate online sessions, one-on-one -on -one with your students, actually it is possible for us to have a more engaging experience with students and kind of bridge that problem that we have with online teaching, which is that it is not engaging anymore. The, uh, the other thing about online teaching is that it literally brings the world to the classroom, right? So previously we had to get all these uh, uh, very interesting academics, very interesting practicing lawyers. By the time we could get their diaries straight, we were in dire straits. Uh, now we are actually able to get them they are able to come because they all they need to do is dial in from their home or from their office and they're able to talk to our students, uh, provided we plan that well, provided we ensure that uh, the questions are sort of, you know, the flow of questions is sort of regulated very well. It can be a great experience for, for students and they get to see um, a variety of external speakers that was hitherto not possible. Right? So that's an advantage of online. The final thing I, I see that I have two minutes to go. So the final thing I need to talk about is skilling, right? Which of course, whether it's online or offline, whether it's traditional classroom or classroom in the bedroom, the idea of teaching skills to students is most important. And again, we are learning that. We're learning that what's important is to teach broadly three kinds of things to the students. One, help them communicate better. To help them synthesize information better, that is, collect information from various sources and actually present it in a different fashion. And third, how to be effective, which is a very important skill a lot of our law students um, uh, struggle to have, which is basically completing their assignments and their work on time right? and, uh, and promptly. And I think all of these, these skills, which is where I think law schools need to go, uh, are skills uh, that are uh, in many situations easier to monitor and easier to engage with in online classrooms. So I want to end on a more optimistic note. I think that um, online um, education is here to stay. Uh, online legal education is the way ahead. Uh, the issue for me is not about how effective online education is. I think we have moved beyond that. I think the debate has moved beyond that. I think online education is a great thing. Uh, the, uh, and we'll have to figure out some way to uh, kind of blend it with what we're doing right now. Uh, I think I have other issues, I think, that law schools will have to grapple with, which is if life is going to be largely online education, then what happens to the other life skills that law students need to have? And that, I think, is a, is a looming issue and a, and a bigger issue. Thank you very much, Mr. Surana. Back to you. Thank you, Dr. Nagahali. You did touch upon a lot of important points. I have made notes, so I would like to come back to you with some questions later. Now we move on to our next speaker, Dr. Ananta Padmanabhan. He is the Dean of Daksha Fellowship. Dr. Anant works at the intersection of education, law, and technology. He is occupied with training and pedagogy for lawyers and public policy enthusiasts. He has done pioneering work on regulatory responses in emerging areas such as civilian drones, data protection and privacy, intellectual property rights, including digital copyrights, artificial intelligence, internet of things, and so on. Dr. Padmanabhan has authored many books and articles practiced before the Madras High Court. He was a fellow at the Carnegie India Institute and he is now the Dean at Daksha Fellowship. Dr. Padmanabhan is an alumnus of the National Law School of India University where he received his LLB and he has earned his LLM and SJD from the University of Pennsylvania School of Law. Over to Dr. Ananta Padmanabhan. Thank you, Mr. Swarana. I hope I'm audible. 
and uh, thanks to uh, Loctopus for bringing together this session, of course, in partnership with Symbiosis and Jinzel. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity and I think obviously a very appropriate occasion to talk about legal education. Uh, the speakers before me, all of whom are seasoned academics, have spoken at length, in fact, about some of the challenges when we are transitioning to online education. Uh, I will take a step back and speak about something a little different, uh, but again, very connected, which is to imagine the world as it exists post-COVID, the kind of stress areas that lawyers will have to increasingly engage with, and the kind of uh, uh, revamp to pedagogy and to curriculum that that would demand. Some of which we are doing at Daksha. So I will speak a little bit about the fellowship towards the end. Um, and of course, the challenges in launching a completely new fellowship uh, in a completely greenfield, you know, kind of environment, uh, you know, at this uh, time without any kind of physical outreach, but more about that later. So I'll just begin uh, straight away with what I uh, think uh, is a very important theme that, in fact, uh, Dr. Nigam had uh, sort of uh, uh, stressed upon earlier the idea of uh, the kind of skills that lawyers require, right? So I, I'll go back to the 1990s when there was the Bob McRae report that came out in the United States. Uh, Bob McRae, for all of you here, was the president of the New York Bar Association and the American Bar Association. And uh, something interesting that came out from that report was the stress on certain kind of skills. The emphasis placed on, in particular, legal reasoning, uh, legal research, better communication, all of which Dr. Nigam had emphasized. Now, what does the COVID world uh, you know, bring about as a new kind of skill that lawyers have to uh, sort of engage with? Um, so in addition to everything that Dr. Nigam had mentioned, I would add data skills. So we are really in an increasingly data-fied world. Uh, let's just take the COVID scenario itself, right? A lot of our responses to COVID have been shaped by an understanding of data trying to understand, for instance, uh, contact tracing, right? I mean, again, using a lot of technology. So you have these apps which are really integrating artificial intelligence, facial recognition software, and in addition to that, uh, projections and predictions based on data analysis, right? So that's one kind of response that we have seen to COVID. Similarly, the whole integration of health data, right? And sort of mining all that data to understand how the disease is going to spread where we will be, you know, one month from now, where we, we, we will be two months from now, right? So there is a lot of data being used at the back end in order to make these projections. And this is not just with COVID. COVID is only sort of telling us in a more amplified manner, really, uh, you know, in some sense, the reality that we were already in, right? I mean, let's just take some of these uh, companies that came out, you know, in the last, you know, uh, five years or so. I mean, I graduated in 2007, right? We didn't have a player like Swiggy or a player like Zomato, you know, back then, right? And three or four years down the line, you have these very different entities out there, which are really what I would consider operating at the digital space, right? The digital and the physical, right? And today, of course, with COVID, there are many obstacles and challenges that these entities uh, face, including ride-sharing entities or food delivery apps and so on. But be that as it may, I think what's exciting about all of these uh, entities is that they really started using a lot of data to do things very differently from what the pure brick and mortar player was actually doing, right? Whether it's e-commerce, whether it's food delivery, ride sharing, or any of this, right? So what you really see is a data fight world, right? And COVID really is sort of telling us that this data fight world is about, is, is going to stay. It's not going anywhere. In fact, a lot of our solutions are going to be powered by technology. So what does that mean for the world of lawyers? Two or three different things, right? One, we need to really uh, emphasize a very different kind of curriculum design in terms of understanding technology. Like Shashikala ma'am had mentioned about artificial intelligence and the rise of these technologies, right? So, I mean, as lawyers, we're still grappling with what this means for the world of liability, for the world of regulation, for the world of consumer protection, for the world of competition, for a bunch of different areas of law, right? So. I think the, the substantive areas of law are going through significant churn. Right? Today, if you're a securities lawyer, you cannot live without an understanding of algorithmic trading and what the, the business models are, how technology is sort of interplaying with securities trading and what the regulator then needs to do to understand technology better. 
right so as a lawyer who is really now going to be increasingly pushed to this kind of world much more on account of covid but already a process that we had set our foot into right i think it's it's really important to design the curriculum to adapt to these changes right so for instance i am an intellectual property rights lawyer by training my first book was in it looking at infringement rights and remedies right and today i mean the more i look at you know how judges understand uh, technology right i mean when when it's whether it's anton piller orders in the virtual condo orders all of this right? i mean i think that there is a classic gap existing between the legacy world of law uh, where you know you have uh, judges where you have senior advocates who of course are doing their best to adapt and the new world where there is a lot of technology itself you know shaping our legal norms like something like aadhar is a classic example of that right and today when you're talking about arogya setu for instance it is aadhar you know 1000 times square you know that you're really sort of you know uh, taking that whole idea of aadhar combining it with things like facial recognition and multiple other solutions and really sort of saying that you know we are entering a very different kind of world right and there are the concerns that we are talking about are more amplified and the kind of expertise required to you know bring to the table to address these kinds of concerns is again amplified right so whether it's intellectual property rights in the digital age whether it's questions of data protection or any other set of you know concerns the competition law or any other areas i think the technology element is going to be amplified and we need to think much more about that the second big concern to me is that covid really is going to bring about the rise of the state the state is coming back and already i mean professor majumdar had mentioned the 2008 financial crisis right the financial crisis itself had brought in a lot of consternation about free markets right i mean are these markets really working but what covid is really telling us for sure is that they are not working right i mean when you have to you know solve this problem of unavailability of masks or whether you have to solve the problem of enforcing a lockdown your private actors whether it's the amazons or whether it's the shell corporations cannot really solve that problem right so this requires the state to intervene you need to think about state power very differently and when you think about state power very differently you are thinking about regulatory institutions very differently right so the the rise of regulation right and and in very different ways than what we have already seen with your first wave of liberalization and the kind of market regulators right so we are i think going to move away from a world of market regulators to regulators which are more of the uidai kind the uidai if i'm to recall is not really a market regulator it's really talking about balancing the rights of private entities with citizens with the state and exceptions that the state have to your fundamental rights like your data and privacy and all of that right and so you will need, you will be seeing many more regulators of this kind like a health regulator which is going beyond the entities that are in the health business to understanding health data regulating health data and exceptions to the privacy that we enjoy as citizens to health data so the idea of the regulatory state itself is going to change and therefore curriculum design will have to adapt to that and the third element is of course the functioning of courts let's just look at this for the last two months maybe we are able to run our law schools right but courts are completely paralyzed i mean there are I mean, if, if you look at the way you define an emergency situation it's basically a pil that has been filed in the context of covid or something like that but there are so many other emergent cases right and then we need to really think about how do we end to end change the architecture of the legal you know uh, adjudication system itself right and this is very important for legal education simply for the reason that we are going to train students for this new world right so we have to really imagine up this new world so that could mean things like online dispute resolution heightened you know uh, emphasis on that it could mean things like digitization end to end right i mean we we haven't seen that happen it could mean complete revamp of the court registry we may not be able to work with the current set of people and their skill sets we may for instance like what we did with the passport office many years ago have a tcs handling the entire i mean that's just one company i'm taking by name you know have entities of that kind which are handling the entire front end you know and the whole uh, you know consumer 
uh, interface, right? And the consumer here being the lawyer and of course the client that the lawyer represents. That whole interface being managed by a very different entity. So the whole architecture may be revamped and we need to train students to do all of that. And that's something that we are doing at the Daksha Fellowship. So that let me take a few minutes to talk about the fellowship. So this is not really a, a degree program. It's really thinking about some of the uh, questions that Professor Nigam had raised, right? In terms of how are we doing the skilling? And I'm sure Abhida is here and he could speak a lot more about it. I'm just beginning this journey and he's been far out into this journey. But to quickly sort of, you know, mention the fellowship itself, what we are really doing is to look at these three elements, right? The technology law and policy element, the law and regulation, and the dispute resolution element. Project what these things are going to mean in a post-COVID world. Of course, we have really been thinking about this fellowship pre-COVID as well. But what is it really going to be post-COVID? And then designing it. And we have actually just completely you know, launched this fellowship in COVID time. So some of the challenges that law schools have faced, we have faced it probably to a higher extent because you guys have a great brand, right? I mean, Jindal is a brand. Symbiosis is a brand. I mean, Dr. Nigam himself is a brand, right? So we are really sort of trying to you know, create something. And a lot of what we are doing really is therefore working with practitioners. A lot of the webinars that we are doing, a lot of the fireside chats that we are doing, we are bringing on board practitioners, adding value to students, and thereby you know, trying to really also you know, create the Daksha brand in the middle of all of this. And then therefore, for all of you, you know, just check out the fellowship. There are many interesting things there. But the long and short of it is that the post-COVID world will require emphasis on very different courses and curriculum than what we have seen in the past. And I think with that, my time is up. Over back to you, uh, sir. And and look forward to hearing from some of the other panelists. Thank you. You made some very important, interesting points. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anand Padmanabhan. Now we have a law practitioner as our next speaker, Mr. Karthik Ranganathan. He is an advocate, come company secretary with an LLB from Mysore University, LLM from New York University, and he is currently pursuing his PhD from the National Law School in Investment and Economic Laws. Karthik has offices in Chennai and Bangalore and advises a wide range of clients across various sectors over the last 15 years. He is also a visiting faculty at National Law School of India, Bangalore. Over to you, Karthik. Good evening, Dr. Suran and all of you, especially all the audience. And thank you so much for giving this uh, opportunity to share my views. I noticed that uh, I'm the only practitioner here. And it so happened that because of my practical experience, the then vice chancellor at National Law School was kind enough to offer me an opportunity to teach at National Law School as a visiting faculty. In fact, for between 2013 and 2017, for four years, I had taught at National Law School tax laws, foreign exchange laws, and security laws. And I also had the opportunity of being invited to NUJS Kolkata, Nilesar, and other universities in India to conduct a one or two credit seminar course. Now, I would like to briefly make my thoughts, share my views on two aspects. One is with regard to my experiences that I had at National School and how we could expand. You know, we could, especially at this point in time, after this COVID-19 pandemic, where online teaching and online courses has become the new normal now. Now, if the same views were shared or proposed 10 years ago, that might have not been as zealously considered as it would be considered now by the universities because they are in fact they are looking out or rather unless online courses happen there's going to be no courses being conducted at all that's happening in u.s universities that's happening in uk universities where they have to they're compelled only to uh, uh, conduct the courses uh, online now i would also like to share my views with regard to the, the practitioner's point of view especially when Professor Majumdar was mentioning his fourth point with regard to how we can bring on board the practitioners, the Supreme Court judges, High Court judges, senior advocates. Now, rest assured, uh, Professor Majumdar, uh, the acceptance rate of technology uh, has been phenomenal uh, from top to bottom, where the Supreme Court judges, High Court judges, senior advocates, uh, law firm partners have embraced technology uh, in, in more than expected manner. There are at least half a dozen Supreme Court judges who are regularly providing uh, 
uh, the, the webinars to various bar associations and to academies. And similarly, at least speaking for Madras High Court, there are at least a dozen judges who come forward to uh, share their views to the bar association as well as to the students. Now, with regard to my experience at National Law School, uh, when I started teaching from 2013, in 2015, in fact, I had reached out to then Vice Chancellor and the Registrar with a proposal that why not NLS connect with uh, foreign universities? I'm saying five years ago, but now J, you know, JGLS is a pioneer with regard to collaboration with foreign universities. Uh, that's, that was especially because uh, my view was with regard to NYU School of Law, which is also my alma mater, because NYU School of Law was conducting a double LLM program uh, at NUS. It was called as uh, NYU at NUS till 2010. And it was a very famous uh, uh, LLM program, uh, which really was interested. There was uh, most of the students, or majority of the students who registered for that LLM program uh, was actually from India. So in fact, uh, they gave me a go ahead saying that I could reach out to NYU if possible. And I reached out to some professors at NYU with regard to the way ahead. They directed me to the graduate admissions, then to the vice dean. It so happened I wrote to the dean of NYU School of Law itself. And most of the law schools in US are highly bureaucratic. In spite of that, I did write a, a, a request saying that, will there ever be interested in partnering with National Law School in uh, considering conducting a double LLM program or so, a kind, whether with uh, you know, National Law School. And interestingly, they did not shoot down the proposal. And in, they had considered it, they had placed it before their committee. They took a week's time to think about it. And then they wrote back saying that, uh, since only recently they had partnered with the Shanghai Law School and the Dubai Law School, they said, for the time being, we are not uh, looking at having partnership with another law school in India. Now, the reason why I'm mentioning about uh, uh, this experience is, now, had it been, if we were to reach out to law schools in the US or in the UK or European law schools, may not be a full-time LLM program because uh, there, there may be bar council uh, requirements and uh, regulations. But if there can be collaborative programs, which may be range between three months and six months or three months and nine months, something like the executive LLM program or whatever it is, if, if the source, if the supply can be made from uh, uh, Indian law schools, of course, the top tier law schools, I would say, are already partnering with in one way or the other with the uh, various uh, the, the law schools in the US and UK. But those other law schools, which, which are yet to open up in partnering with, they can consider this online, especially uh, now you might be noting, noticing that uh, most of the law schools in the US are only completing their uh, spring semester and summer semester only through remote access. Now, when it comes to remote access, it makes no difference whether I'm sitting in the next room or I'm sitting 10,000 miles away. It's all the same, subject to the time zone. Now, that makes no difference. So that being the case, if the Indian law schools can consider partnering, my view is that, or rather my guess is that the accepting or the probability of those law schools coming forward, because India supplies maximum number of students to US and UK every year, next to China. But that being the case, uh, there, there is a possibility that the really mushrooming or, or those law schools for example, like Professor Nigam, uh, those kind of law schools with his varied experience uh, being in UK and US, if they can partner one way or other, either subject to regulations of full-time or a part-time courses where the, the faculties from the US or UK, they can conduct the classes being there. And whereas the students, they will have to sit in a classroom, of course, with some logistics, support of logistics, like a, a lifetime project, you know, with regard to screen and a projector, and if they can listen to the classes, because I have this experience even while sitting for the New York bar exam, where at least if uh, 15, 20,000 students were participating, the speaker was, was only in one location. All the rest of us, we used to only watch the, 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 the screen in front of us, which was a lifetime screen. And I think that made no difference with regard to the, the discipline, because there used to be uh, some uh, staffs will be coordinating. So that being the case, there is a possibility of considering that law schools across the world, we can partner with uh, those law schools and they can teach from wherever they are. And whereas our students, even if the registration for those courses, if it's 20 to 25, which may be the usual number. And I think that will be a success ongoing. Now, the only fear is that once the lockdown is lifted, we should not forget that the online, the webinars and the online, the technology has brought us together. Now, merely because the conventional, the traditional way of conducting classes comes back to into four, we should not forget that there is so much that can be explored, or this is kind of a treasure core where we can use it to partner with various law schools, uh, both abroad. 
And similarly, informally, I had also reached out to professors at IMB, but that was, of course, uh, with regard to cross credits, because at NYU, uh, when I did my tax LLM program, we could choose some of the courses from NYU uh, Stern uh, School of Business. Similarly, I thought, uh, because Professor Majumdar was also mentioning that with regard to valuation and uh, Dr. Anand was mentioning with regard to the algorithms when it comes to securities laws. Very true that if I'm doing an M&A, very much the corporate finance and the valuation of the, uh, the, the deal may be very important, which may not be taught full-time in a law school, but rather that can very much be done by a business school. Now that business school may be located in the same vicinity, within the same city, or it may be, it might be ISB Hyderabad, it might be Indian Institute of Statistics in Kolkata. So it may be across the country. Now, this is one possibility, this online courses that can converge us. What otherwise uh, the making the students or the faculties to travel was a bottleneck. Now that can easily be uh, uh, overridden by, by having this online or, or classroom sessions where faculties being in their own place, they can teach the classes and the students from here can register. I would also like to say with regard to the tier two and three, tier three law schools, where those law schools are uh, located, situated in the hinterlands, where the nearest access to a city may be 100, 200 kilometers. In those cases, they can partner with the elite law schools. For example, if it's National Law School, Bangalore, they can consider a peripheral of 200, 250 kilometer radius. All the law schools which are interested, they can partner with them or the tier two, tier three law schools can reach out to NLS or other elite law schools where there can be one or two credits courses. Now I'm sure that uh, over time, the, the zeal of the students to register for such, such courses would definitely increase because there are so many bright students in tier two and tier three law schools also are only waiting for an opportunity. Because when I used to travel from Mysore to national school, I used to stay there for uh, a week's time, use the national school library, which used to be open till 12 o'clock. That was really uh, uh, all, you know, I was struck by all that a uh, library was being open till 12 o'clock. Now, I think those kind of students who are keen and interested in exploring the resources of, of other elite law schools, of course, I don't mean to say that uh, national law school or other schools do not have uh, uh, you know, online courses. In fact, NLS has a dedicated distant education department where there are online courses. But I understand that the, the registration happens online, but the participation will have to happen on, on Sundays. So the students will have to come to the campus, they have to attend the program, and then they have to... But rather now, if we can only try to substitute, you know, we can increase the, the level or the percentage of conducting courses online apart from the regular courses. Now that would definitely help those law schools which may not have access to huge resources. Now, of course it takes two to tango. The, the tier two, tier three law schools should also take part in it. But this can be considered because there are several students also may be participating. And I get invited from national school even now that the, it's, it's entirely from the students uh, community saying that, can I come there uh, to teach for a week's time or two weeks as one or two uh, credit courses? Now, I was also asked to teach at uh, Tamil Nadu National School and NLU Odisha, but for want of time, I could not do that. Now, what I would say is that if we can consider, if rather the law schools can consider conducting those courses, the seminar courses entirely online, rather than having a, a real time or physical presence of the faculty, especially I was invited when I say I, I speak on behalf of all the practitioners who have flair for teaching. Now, it may be difficult. I could not go to Odisha or to Trichy to teach there because I was, my schedule was, uh, was filled. But rather if they offer me now saying that, will you be interested, dedicate two hours every evening for two weeks time? And can you conduct an online course? I would definitely say yes. And like that, there will be many practitioners, the, especially the alumni from those law schools, who can come back because they may be located uh, across the country, across the globe. But if they can dedicate one or two hours every day, by which they can reach back to the law school online. And uh, I think that way we can definitely fill the gap. The, the requirements that, uh, as, as Professor Majumdar was mentioning, that uh, giving back to the law school after graduating, because much is being learned uh, in, the, in the turf rather than the law school. Now, there can be connect between the two. And, and uh, uh, with regard to the senior advocates and the, and the judges, as I said, already they have really embraced. It's usually said that uh, litigating lawyers and the courts are light years away from technology. Now, I think that has been uh, proven wrong because in just a week's time, the Supreme Court judges and the High Court judges have uh, uh, accepted reaching out to the Bar Association and the advocates uh, through online. And they have been talking to laptops, imagine 
where where uh, that that's a, that that was not experienced by them at all and many of the sensitive cases are being conducted online uh, video conferencing so now when necessity is the uh, law i think that way we can uh, definitely consider exploiting these avenues where the law schools it may be cross border for elite law schools it may be cross state also it can be intra state or within the city where tier 2 3 law schools can reach out to the nearby elite law schools and having uh, it may be even a lecture for example if a law school in mysore wants to have a guest lecture by a senior advocate now currently conventionally they should ask them to travel all the way from delhi to mysore which takes them at least you know a two flights to catch and another four hours on road which definitely would uh, uh, you know uh, that they may not be really interested but if now given the amounts of webinars and the participation that is happening if the faculty or if that particular speaker can be at his office or home and if there is some logistics of course if there are dedicated uh, lecture rooms with projectors and uh, lifetime screens i think that can very well be done where the uh, many of the uh, students who want to have uh, uh, you know resources or or rather the aspiration of these judges and advocates law firm partners can definitely be uh, exploited so uh, that is what uh, briefly i thought uh, i would like to share because the time is limited and we have already crossed our uh, the the expected time so we should not forget the take away from this covid 19 the blessing this guys is that now many of you spoke about the current the difficulty that is being undergone in reaching out to students and faculties but what i would like to say is that taking it further even if the lockdown let's say in 3 months or 6 months if it is lifted we should never forget or or give up the zest that what contribution can online courses or webinars can contribute it may range from having uh, one or two credits courses or it can be frequent lectures and it can also be autonomy can be given to the student associations where they can arrange for it it need not everything be on the faculties itself so that way i think uh, there are several people out there who would like to get back to the law school to teach uh, subject to their convenience now that can be overcome by staying in their own place in office or at home and giving one or two like our lectures with some you know uh, good sophisticated logistics i think that is one of the best ways by which uh, we can rope in the those experiences that they have gained after going to the law uh, out of law school they can give back uh, uh, to the law schools and, and and to the students especially so this is what uh, i thought i could share and and thank you once again for this opportunity thank you very much karthik you yes, covered sir. a lot of lot of subjects lot of points now we come to our last speaker mr abhyudhay agarwal he is the co-founder and coo of law sikho and i pleaders abhyudhay agarwal in his 10 years has made a name and an impact in the field of delivering practical online legal education in india for lawyers chartered accountants company secretaries and working professionals the icco platform is a web based access to justice platform and over the years both these platforms have played an important role in legal education and in access to justice abhuday agarwal is an alumnus of the west bengal nujs over to you abhuday thank you sir for the introduction thank you uh, tanuj for inviting me and thank you uh, to the sponsors and the organizing teams and thank you everybody here for listening uh, so i was answering some of the questions while the session was going on um, i want to just divide this uh, conversation of 10 minutes into certain uh, broad heads one is the immediate impact for uh, law students when it comes to internships and jobs and things they can do second part would be that which are the industry sectors that we see uh, may take off in a post covid scenario because whatever is going to increase it's a good time for us to prepare for that the third point is i'm going to look at a little bit of signs of pivoting by law firms okay what are the changes that they are planning ahead whatever is known publicly from that and the fourth part is that we're going to look at the role of lawyers and the skills required in the 21st century or in a post covid scenario 
So uh, let's start with the first one, uh, everyone. This is on the immediate impact for internships and jobs. There are so many students who've got confirmed internships or job offers from uh, the top tier law firms, medium-sized law firms, smaller law firms, which have all been suspended in a post in a COVID lockdown scenario. Uh, while people have still continued to work from home, lawyers who were doing transactional work are still working from home, but the firms haven't had that kind of bandwidth to sort of accept interns, share data with them and all of that because a different kind of technological setup is required to do that. It was easier to do that while the intern was in the physical premises of the law firm. Okay, now this means that a law firm will have to invest to enable this to be possible. They will do this, but they will find training interns and onboarding and selection to be more difficult and they may need help with that. And they will look for more, uh, they will look for only the best candidates Okay, which means that the responsibility for law students to stand out and to demonstrate that they can do the work required increases a lot. Okay, so it may be that you have to really claim your place and you know get in one way or another from the side. From the by what do I mean by the side? Because there may not be formal internship hiring programs for the duration of this lockdown. Okay, so people will work, if you are looking to get in, you will need to sort of start building your profile, build your own credibility and get to know some of the senior lawyers working there, senior associates, principal associates, so that you can at least build a relationship with them so that when things resume, you are uh, considered for regular internships or at least for online internships when uh, the law firms are ready for this, okay? What are the things that you can do? It is very important in this time that, you know, it can come as a very jarring fact, as a very discouraging fact that internships and job offers have been canceled. But it is a good idea right now to build your own profile online. In our courses, for example, we are encouraging students every week when they perform the exercises which pertain to real client work, like it is abstracted and mock scenarios are made. We encourage people to start sharing on LinkedIn also because we realize that some of our students have become very, very smart who've performed all the courses, but they are not exactly able to represent this to outsiders. So now we've built that in. Now, if you start doing that, Okay, it doesn't matter if you do our course or not, but if you start doing that, you will find yourself in a position to sort of gain traction. People will start interacting with you, all of that. Of course, doing a course enables you to do that faster because you will have a higher level of learning. The other thing to look at is that uh, instead of looking at formal internships where somebody can guide you, train you, anyway, that doesn't happen to the maximum extent possible in an internship. But instead of looking out for that, look for people you can help. Right now, there are many young companies where they do not have, you know, a hierarchical team uh, where you need a senior to guide you and you don't have like a feudal structure, okay? So there you, there, for example, a startup owner will, a startup founder will consider a law intern to be a lawyer, okay? They can think of it like that. Like how as lawyers, we think that, Acha, this guy is an IIT student. This is an IIT grad. So he can do all the coding work for us. So the same perspective is there for startup entrepreneurs also. So this is a very good time, irrespective of the fact that whether you uh, get paid, whether you do real, uh, whether you get paid or get an internship or a certificate or not, start to collect people's problems and understand what they need. Okay. Also, if you're working with senior lawyers, there are a lot of lawyers who need help in building their own profile, in showcasing their work, building their own YouTube channel. You can help them do that, okay? And that will that is something nobody else does for them. Their juniors will be busy working on the matters that they've got, okay? So you can help them do that. And when there is a need, guess whom they will call when they need somebody to help them, they want to recruit some Because they know you better, they want to get in touch with you. Okay, so with startups, you can help them in renegotiate and record contracts uh, or amendments, okay? And what is fun about this is that you get to know what are the real challenges they are facing. Okay, and there are multiple variety of scenarios. It's not just one force majeure clause. Trust me, there are so many ramifications of this because at the heart of it, it hits business. Okay, so you can't just take a technical legal standpoint and argue your way through it. So people are dealing with it, business is dealing with it in a very different way from what a classical legal argument is. Okay, the next thing to look at is that which are the transactions that are going to increase? What's the kind of work that we see coming up? So uh, the fintech industry definitely is going to like shoot up, okay? Because uh, everything is going digital, right? So anything that is purely electronic, which doesn't have a logistics angle, like fintech doesn't have a logistics angle, okay? Unless it's integrated with like an e-commerce tool. So if there's a 
lender which is saying that when you purchase something from amazon i'm going to give you a free loan then of course there is a problem like there is a logistics issue but in most cases fintech is going to shoot up anyway okay so lawyers as anant was saying that you need to look at uh data you need to understand how data works okay you need to be un- understanding how data protection works how technical things work so lawyers earlier would look at three things go to court sit in a company do a job or you know sit in a law firm today when you are dealing with data you might end up taking up a coding program then you might end up reviewing a website you might end up conducting a training for a team or of businessmen okay business teams ke liye you will conduct training you will review a process map that they have made this kind of legal work will be there okay you might design a workflow for data to flow from one place to another so that data security policies or gdpr is not violated so these kind of tasks will also come in the mainstream picture of lawyering okay so what happens for lawyers is now that you are going to be looking at solutions versus reading the law learning the law knowing what the law is analyzing it critiquing it you're going to be looking at this that when a client wants x how can i as a lawyer help him achieve that i may my knowledge of law and contracts and all of that is important but first and foremost is the client's business goal and that is where uh, we have to look at like if you're studying an llb course we need to understand what are our friends on the business side of things learning what is the commercial intent of different kinds of parties and this will apply anywhere okay if you're working for an ngo or a think tank they also get funding from certain parties so you will have to understand that what are they trying to hit at with their research which is the direction in which it has to go so industry knowledge will be important for any industry and the non profit industry is also a sector okay education is a sector so you got to understand that side of things uh in house jobs are going to increase because fintech companies will want lawyers inside the company uh then because of the lockdown you've seen the negative publicity that china has been getting companies are going to look at alternative manufacturing destinations so in india you're going to have more greenfield investment or investment in existing indian companies if uh, because india is well poised to take its route as an alternative manufacturing uh, destination we we have to see that in the coming years but india is well positioned for that uh, also if india rides the covid crisis well there is a lot of scope for indian companies buying overseas companies so overseas acquisitions might increase we are seeing some initial news around that okay now there are law firms who are already starting to pivot in this way like if you see yesterday there was a post from an associate partner at lakshmi kumaran and sri dharan who said that we are hiring uh, lawyers with expertise in technology law and corporate law in these positions so earlier it was lakshmi kumaran and sri dharan was a market leader in tax but imagine the the, the post shows how much they are expanding into uh, corporate and data uh, sorry corporate and technology so this this is one way in which law firms are uh, pivoting there are tax firms which are thinking of this that uh, how can we take up the post covid work do we need to get into contracts do we need to get into uh, let's say criminal litigation aspects of tax uh, because the government may need revenues and it may will it will want businesses not to avoid paying tax so they may initiate criminal proceedings where possible so how can we leverage or how can we go into regular arbitration and litigation given the fact that uh, post covid this kind of work may increase so law firms have started to th- think like that another thing that is happening is that the security of a job as we thought about it may not be the same anymore you might see siril amarchand mangaldas story on bar and bench which was covered which said that the equity partners are taking uh, no salaries this year salaried partners are having uh, a a division of compensation and more compensation moves into variable fixed pay reduces and this is trickling down till uh, i think senior associate or principal associate level what does this mean okay uh, or it's not trickling down to principal associate level it's trickling to the salaried partner level but what this means is that gradually people are understanding the changing nature of law practice and the entrepreneurial nature of a law job okay so to some extent you can take shelter in the fact that you have a job but to a large extent it's going to be on the basis of your skills that you've got to stand okay now uh, as far as online education is concerned people are really identifying the fact that online education is no more a bunch of study material it's no more a scam with mainstream universities taking classes online people are understanding and it's becoming accepted that classes can be taken out online like it takes us so long to explain to a, a student who's inquiring to a, uh, with us about a course about how this is not a scam and how we are validly conducting classes we are guiding you we will be there to help you out people just don't believe it 
but now since they are seeing that you know in every college is going online they are seeing that okay a realistic interaction is possible and this is not about taking the money and then vanishing from uh, from the scene so that in that way the belief in online has become strengthened also lawyers are beginning to identify that you know career options can be more diversified in this scenario lawyers who were pure play litigators are finding it difficult but anybody who was not a pure play litigator is having is still having work and what lawyers are realizing is that if i am a litigator i still need to know contracts if i am a contract drafting lawyer i still need to know litigation because if my force majeure clause goes into litigation my client will come to me if it's a bad one i need to help in renegotiating the deal okay so these are some examples that that i am talking about okay so how much more time do i have about a minute about a minute okay so the role of lawyers at the moment is to develop understanding of solutions what do clients want combination of litigation contract strategy review of software this comes into the whole uh into their actual domain okay also things like identifying what is my vision for myself so many people i see have quit law firm jobs and are dissatisfied because the jobs they want don't exist okay by the way this happened to me in 2012 when i quit a corporate law firm job the job i wanted to be an educator create content didn't exist so i had to create that for myself create a company that enables me to do that now that's possible for so many people who want to do that anant for example has created the daksha fellowship i think to like you know fulfill the vision that he had for himself or for other lawyers now if you have a vision that i want to a lot of people say i want to move out of law but that's probably the best way to do that is to sort of take law with you and move out and you know realter what people see as law okay so but the thing is that those are job zone exist so nobody will give you that certainty you have to walk an uncertain path and that's when you'll be stuck with my batchmates are making tons of money in law firms okay because you don't have enough evidence to see that how the market is getting hit right now but you will have to have some faith in yourself for a period of time 5 to 10 years but you can survive with skills you can always survive okay you might not be super duper rich that fast but you will survive and you can make an impact that's so that requires some mental strength that requires looking at alternative skills like leadership communicating your vision hiring people a little bit of team building okay also knowing how do i manage a project how do i delegate work so it's very soon becomes not a function of how smart you are and how good you are at analysis but whether you can enable another person to be as good as you are or better whether you can find better people to execute that vision and inspire them so that becomes very important okay now these are skills that we need and some of the tools we need to be conversant with are like powerpoints uh, google docs so many lawyers who use microsoft word take a long while to get onto google docs okay and it just enables collaboration for there are microsoft also has similar tools think a project management tool like a trello or an asana enables you to work online and collaborate in a digital environment okay uh knowing excel of course that is something that's really useful the second uh, now this is i have moved through in a flow on how things are changing and how this is and and this is going to be the lasting model going forward very soon courts will adapt to online hearing law firms will start taking online interns but this will take some time so right now you've got to start preparing for it studying learning executing building your profile okay and for universities we've got a virtual campus library uh which is actually a way to train law students over a period of a year into practical skills anybody who is interested in knowing that can get in touch with me later after the session and we can share how we can help on that so so that the llb structure can be supplemented with a continuous learning program on the practical skills side and it's very affordable for universities and students okay uh, so with that i would like to complete and uh, wrap up uh, tanuj your question is to Yeah. Okay, so, so with with that, I have completed what I had to say, and thank you so much for inviting me. Thanks, Abhijit. Cool. Uh, thank you, everyone, for those wonderful presentations. Uh, it was great hearing all of you. Uh, I have one question for everyone, and maybe we can start with uh, Dr. Shashi Kala, ma'am. Uh, just to sum up the presentations, just to sum up the sort of discussions which we have had. is what are the mindsets or what are the skills which law students and law faculty now in a post covid world need to develop and how can they go about developing it do these change in a post covid world or do these remain the same 
ma'am, if you could please start with you. Ma'am, you are on mute. Thank you, Tanuj. I have already replied your question on the box. Uh, to be quick, in one minute, uh, I would say the mindset uh, for a lawyer or a, a law teacher or the law student is the mindset of being a professional, of a, being a justice defender, being ever ready to learn. In the post-COVID situation, most of these things remain unchanged, but only one uh, issue that will be more important is uh, the uh, openness to learning, openness to be team teaching, uh, in terms of teachers, because a uh, lot of uh, online modules now will become the way of the, uh, I mean, the norm of the day. Secondly, their uh, openness to work from home and our law schools will have to be a little flexible because we may see more research coming out. We may see more uh, job satisfaction if people are given that option of being flexible. I know that in Jindal such opportunities there, but in some of our law schools, we need to be a little more flexible. Then coming to the skill sets, we have already identified certain skill sets. Uh, we have a very structured legal skill center with advocacy, drafting, technology, managerial, ethical, etc. But I feel technology as a skill needs to be a little more uh, uh, reworked in the post-COVID context. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Professor Majumda. Um, because of the nature of the practice of law, which is, in my view, that the very core is to offer perspective. And how do we do so? By, by communicating. Whether we are communicating with each other in a, in a courtroom or in a boardroom or in a classroom or in an online room, we are still communicating. I don't think there will be too many changes required by law students, by academics, by practitioners in a post-COVID environment. But this is what I tell all my students, whoever comes in, that one of the key skills, and, 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 and really this is the one key skill that I require all my students to have, or to at least um, to develop while they're in law school, is that of critical thinking. You know, um, <clears throat> we've been told that this is the law. The question is why? And more importantly, the skill to ask the question why? And that stems from a very simple idea. That is, assume nothing. You know, last month, we all assumed that courts and lawyers and judges would be slow to adopt technology. And as we've seen over the last one month, and indeed this discussion, they've been one of the fastest. Let us not assume anything. Once you adopt that position of assuming nothing, you then embark on a journey of questioning everything including what you know about the law and why the law is the way it is. So if it was one skill that for all um, lawyers, legal practitioners, academics, um, law students, myself included, is to continuously assume nothing. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Nagam. Uh, so you are on mute. Thank you. Um, if I were to uh, look at one skill that uh, law schools need to develop, it is adaptability. Uh, I think that's what uh, a lot of law students particularly struggle to do. So you can teach them contract law, you can teach them civil procedure, but uh, how and when they can apply it to a real life situation, uh, which they are not used to, is where uh, problems are created. And I think within this idea of adaptability, you can bring in a lot of other things that are being discussed by the panelists already, that they have to be good communicators, uh, they have to synthesize information, they have to be effective, they have to have good uh, project management skills, they need to have um, good uh, computer application skills, somebody mentioned Excel, uh, they have to have good data management skills, as Anand put it. Uh, so all of this comes, I think, within the broader rubric of someone being adaptable. And I think that's what the post-COVID especially, that's what employers would be looking at. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Dr. Anand. Yeah, so I will uh, second uh, both uh, Professor Nigam and Professor Majumda. Uh, I mean, adaptability, I think, is going to be absolutely critical. I mean, we just have seen how difficult it has been to sort of cope with these changes, right? And I think increasingly the world is headed in this 
kind of direction where we'll have to quickly sort of change strategies. So having a plan is great, but you know you may have to really change your plan depending on the circumstances that arise. Uh, and the second part is, of course, the critical thinking element, and I think that's absolutely critical, right? I mean, to have that you know thinking in our uh, you know curriculum design, and of course in our general approach to how we how we look at the world as lawyers, I think that's a it's a very important uh, skill, and that I guess was always an important skill. It will become even more significant, I guess, in the years to come. Thank you, uh, Mr. Karthik. Yeah. Uh, as I said, the impact that can uh, teaching by the faculties real time in a classroom that can definitely not be substituted by online courses. But having said that, I would only say that the the rate at which the online courses that were being conducted or are being conducted prior to an era prior to COVID-19 should significantly be different post COVID-19 era. The law schools should definitely embrace the opportunity of tying up and collaborating with various other law schools, as I said, within as well as out of the country. And the tier two, tier three law schools, which are situated in the hinterlands, should definitely reach out to the elite law schools in the country where they can have lectures, short courses, one or two credits courses, and they can also bring in experts in the field. And there are so many lawyers like me who have the flair for teaching where uh, maybe physically traveling to the law schools may be difficult, but uh, conducting the courses online would definitely uh, the cusp that you know with regard to the graduating uh, the uh, law school students in the law school and the experience that it's being lacking. So especially the 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 uh, partners from law firms will be able to tell better with regard to what is required while drafting or or, or while finalizing a deem a merger an acquisition or litigating lawyer will be able to explain better with regard to the procedural aspects appearing before the court. And the judges can definitely tell what is expected of the law students when they actually venture into the legal profession. So that way, they should definitely, the online courses in the coming days should supplement and should enhance over a period of time, which should definitely meet all those gray areas where the resources, obtaining resources at some point in time was difficult. Now that, that gap can be filled by, by uh, conducting uh, more and more online courses and lectures. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Abhidhar. Hi, Tanuj. So uh, your question is, what is the mindset that universities or faculties can keep in mind and students can keep in mind? So I think I, I want to say just three things. One is survival at any point beats everything else. So if we can learn how to survive, uh, that has to be our key focus. Whether, so it should, whether we need to adapt, change our paradigms, our paradigms of success, it's fine. But survival has to be focused on and we should be happy with that okay if we can survive people should not go into uh, a tangent about oh my god what a big problem this is not like that second is that we have to be careful about comparison every time we go on our own path we try to compare that oh this guy has become a law firm partner this person has become a senior advocate and what are we doing in our lives that has to uh, stop somewhere okay and second is that we are scared to go on our own path because nobody else has gone there so there is nobody else validating us if we can address these three at the level of the law school itself, okay, if faculty is able to enable students to be free of this, I think a lot of innovation will happen uh, from, from there for, by students. Thank you, Abhidhar. With this, uh, I'll hand this over to Dr. Surana for concluding remarks and a vote of thanks. Thank you, Panel. It has been absolutely wonderful. I am sure all our attendees must have had a lot of food for thought. We spoke about various skills required in the changing times. We spoke about survivability. We spoke about learning new skills. We spoke about how law schools can offer courses through the use of various professionals through technology. There are a lot of questions being asked about job prospects in this scenario. I think overall the session was wonderful. A lot of food for thought. And that is what we set out to do in the first place, to provide our attendees with a lot of things to contemplate about. And as Professor said, in the Socrates method, a lot of questions are thrown up and the student 
tries his or her best to answer and try to come up with the best answers relevant for themselves. So I think the panelists did an absolutely wonderful job of creating a lot of questions, a lot of thoughts in the minds of the participants. Thank you very much. It was a very enlightening session. I made a lot of low notes and I learned a lot. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much everyone for attending. Thanks. Thanks a lot to our panelists for joining in. Thanks. Thank you, Tanush. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. 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 And Thanks. Care. Goodbye. Thank you, sir. So we are going to D-Link. Thank you. Thank you.